If you could turn back time, what would you do? Would you go back and try to erase the mistakes you'd made? Try to do things better? Or would you merely have as much fun as you could? Knowing that it had no consequences because you could relive it again and again as many times as you wished. Now, this is precisely the dilemma that the protagonist in today's story faces. And the consequences are interesting to say the least. Well, my dear friends, it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I've just realized I'm not a time traveler. I've made a lot of mistakes. I didn't know what I was doing, I swear. I'm still trying to comprehend the magnitude of the damage I've caused. The sheer amount of lives I've destroyed. To anyone affected by a short, scruffy guy named Axel, well, I'm sorry. I just hope that writing it all down can perhaps absolve me, even just a little. I'll give anything for some forgiveness. I don't think I deserve it, though. Not after what I've done. I'll start at the beginning. I first realised, or rather thought, that I was a time traveller when I was about eleven. My mum had just fallen and broken her neck, and I remember everything coming to a stop. I remember her head twisted around, the sound of the snap echoing endlessly, a muffled, oh, underneath. My oh. The oh started to reverse, though, as if someone pressed the rewind button of a VHS tape. And, sure enough, the visual followed the sound. My mum's tear rolled back up, her neck untangling, her body being pulled up like a marionette back into a standing position, back in front of the spill. Press play. Mum. Mum, stop. The words erupted from my mouth before I had a chance to lasso them back. My mum jumped, stumbling forwards, landing with her temple on stone. The moment paused again, Mum's mouth agape in a startled, oh, the counter corner embedded in her skull. Rewind. Play. This time, I dove forward and pulled her into a hug. The roast she was holding fell to the floor, joining the grease stain she hadn't noticed. Hun, what's wrong? I guess the fact that her ambivalent and withdrawn preteen son hugging her for the first time in years overrode the shock of a spilled dinner. I started to cry. I probably wept and the next few weeks all blurred into one continuous smear. My mum didn't believe me when I told her about seeing her die right in front of me. She took me to a paediatrician first, who then referred us to a psychologist, who pointed the way to a psychiatrist. I was medicated, thought to have early-onset bipolar, in the middle of a mixed episode. I heard words like oh, manic, and delusions of grandeur, but I didn't care. I was having the time of my life. Sure, the sedatives made me feel funny, and I was still too young to really object to the medications, but I couldn't get in the way of using my newfound superpower. I could rewind time. Anytime my mum said something condescending, or when my little sister refused to let me have my turn on the game, or even just because I'm bored, well, I'll go wild. It felt so good to be able to just slap Eva whenever she bugged me, or knock the meds out of my mum's hands. Sometimes, I'd even throw everything not bolted down outside my window. Well, I could always rewind, and just not be a little shit. 
Everything was fine. I never dealt with consequences. Yes, I was an angelic teen. The perfectly behaved straight-A student. Dating the most popular girl in school. In line to be student body president. I knew every word to say. Every test answer. Everything I needed to coast through life. Then, I found out I could travel forward in time when I lost my virginity. I'm not going to bore you with my many failed attempts that I made at a fumbling first time, but let's just say that about on the fourth take, <laughs> I was euphoric. I closed my eyes from the sight of Lily under me and opened them to the same thing, only she was older. Her eyes had crow's feet and I could see grey hair snaking across our pillows. Where before she was screaming in ecstasy, this lily was in agony. Stop, baby, stop, please. Before I could stop the words, my mouth spoke. Oh, you cheating cunt, I'll fucking kill you. Before I could stop the movement, my hands were wrapped around her throat. My grip tightened. Her thrashing slowed. I closed my eyes in relief and opened them in tears. Still over Lily, still in the back of the car. Oh, baby, was I that good? She said, chuckling, wiping at my tears. Well, I broke up with her that night. I didn't know if I needed to have sex again or just reach the same state of pleasure, so I put on some porn and went at it. Nothing. Just a mess. So I asked a friend for something to feel good. I heated a spoon, lay in bed, and tried to let go. I thought of graduating high school, college, getting my first house. I thought of my future partner, maybe some children, definitely a cat. I was transfixed on the imagery of my eyes aging. Baby, wake up. You're lying on my shit. The voice was scratchy, like they were fighting a head cold. When I opened my eyes, the person looked just as wretched. I almost gagged at her breath. Looking down, we were both naked. Track marks as common as stretch. I felt bile rising, and flipped over on the bed to vomit three bean soup back onto the three bean-coloured carpet. Oh, fucking finally. That voice. Celia, my first college girlfriend. I fucking hate her. Well, she said, do you want any or not? Rewind. I never went to that party. I never let myself meet Celia. I didn't even let myself have painkillers. Not after that path that I'd seen. So... Maybe you're getting a bit of a picture of what I'm capable of. I can travel forward at will, and however long I travel backwards, I must relive everything after the point I stop at. It's not perfect, but it made for a hell of a good life. I wasn't always a good person, though. I swear, I didn't think it would have any repercussions. Not like this. There was this one girl, Juno who denied me at every turn. I tried time and again to win her over, but she was adamant that she didn't want to be around me, let alone date me. I wasn't used to this kind of rebuttal. I was used to getting what I want, after a few tries. So, when she didn't give me what I wanted, I took it. I felt so guilty that I couldn't even finish before rewinding and scuttling off. But I kept dreaming about it. I couldn't help but think 
I could have anything, any one that I wanted. And so I did it again. So, yeah, I was the time-traveling sexual predator. But, oh, it gets worse. There was a kid in my grade, Paul, who bugged the hell out of me. Something never seemed right with him, and he could make my hair stand on end just by looking at me. I grew to hate that weaselly little creep over the years. That was my state of mind, when I heard that he had his eyes on my sister, Eva. And not just his own eyes, but others too. He apparently found a tree outside our house that his bony ass could comfortably sit on while he jerked off to my pre-teen sister changing. He sold the images online. Now, I may have done what I've done, but at least I can undo my actions. At least I'm not a freaking paedophile. I beat him to a pulp. I threw him out of windows. I slaughtered him and his entire family. I was furious, and no amount of murder satisfied me. Eventually, I settled on dumping him in the ocean, still writhing under the cement blocks. And I covered my tracks. It wasn't enough, though. Suppose the entire world froze, except for you. Every person, every bird, every tree. Completely still, but still alive. What would you do? Yeah, don't toss any bullshit like, oh, eat all the ice cream, or oh, steal all the money. You'd fuck everyone you've ever wanted to fuck. You'd kill everyone. Anyone who'd ever pissed you off. Yeah, you'd wreak havoc. You'd be absolutely and utterly free to do whatever you pleased. And so, I did. My entire adulthood was riddled with mass murder, destruction, making art out of agony. I loved going just long enough to let the newspapers come up with a nickname for my alter ego, then rewinding to switch up my methods. <laughs> I was particularly fond of Mr. Splice. But, well, Zodiac Killer had a nice ring too. But, well, I digress. You see, I swear, I thought I was doing no harm. These people, in this timeline, it would all be erased. They would never know the pain I'd caused, the deaths on my hands. They'd just see Axel... Just a humble mechanic, taking care of his sick mom. I thought, every time I rewound, so did time. But I'm older now, too weary to go back to my youth and try again. I'm pretty damn tired. And well, after my heart attack, I saw something I can never forget. I saw everything. Every thread, every line, every divulging path that I thought was demolished was firm, real, devastatingly real. The aftermath to my amusings were tangible, and every time I rewound, the scenes continued. I looked confused, as if I knew I was meant to be somewhere else. I understood. Every single time I reversed my actions, I made a duplicate. My consciousness must have copied, transferred, not even aware that it was a clone, carrying the power with it. And so, I saw every single one of myself being ravaged by police, avenging parents, all the fires that I'd started. I saw the funerals of the inhabitants of homes that I'd burned down, ignorant of whoever was in there. I saw myself, the father of countless children, with countless battered wives, with countless beatings by fathers. I saw myself covered in the blood of my little sister. Her guts ripped open when I tried to play zombie that one time. And I 
will never forget the look on my mother's face when she entered the room to see me, confused, Eva's liver in my mouth, or the feeling of her beating my face with her bare hands. And so I sit here now, old enough to realize that even the slightest change could cause damage, not even I could predict. I've stopped rewinding. I've stopped trying to prevent disasters. I'm just trying to atone. Trying to make up for the things I've done. Maybe, somehow, by some great chance of fate, some timelines may converge, and all the people I've hurt can read this. So, to you. If you were ever hurt by a short, scruffy guy named Axel Ponderosa, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I'm not a time traveller. I'm a multidimensional piece of shit. And I'm making sure I never hurt anyone ever again. Maybe the bullet won't be fast enough before the rewind kicks in. But maybe it will. I guess we'll see. Play. Wow, did not see that coming, eh? Best not to meddle with things you don't understand, I think. If that's a moral for tonight's story, then that is it. Oh, a lot of you ask me to do Edgar Allan Poe from time to time, and to be honest, I am quite keen on doing it, but nobody ends up listening, really. The videos don't seem that popular, so what I'm going to do is stick an old vid where I did a Poe story on the end of this one. Let me know what you think, and of course I'm always open to suggestions, so if you like it, I will do more in the future. Okay, you have a good one. I'll be back with you on Wednesday as usual. But for now, bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? Well... A great many of you have been asking me for a long, long time if I would do some Edgar Allan Poe. And, given that we've just celebrated his however manyth birthday, <laughs> back on uh, January the 19th, 1809, how many years is that? Okay, he'd be 208 if he was still alive, which I wouldn't put it past him. So, it seemed like a good time to delve into his world. A short story this evening, but um, if you like it, I'll probably uh, go back into his uh, extensive uh, catalogue of archives in the future. So, my dear friends, sit back and relax with your favourite drink, because it's time to listen. the chateau into which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance, rather than permit me, in my desperately wounded condition, to pass a night in the open air, was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned among the Apennines, not less in fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance, it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments, 
It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies. Together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, which depended from the walls not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks, which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary. In these paintings, my incipient delirium, perhaps, had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night, to light the tongues of a tall candelabrum, which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet, which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternately to the contemplation of these pictures, and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow, and which purported to criticize and describe them. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devotedly, I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously, the hours flew by, and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and, outreaching my hand with difficulty, rather than disturb my slumbering valet, I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl, just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly, and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent, even to my own perception. But while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments, I again looked fixedly at the painting. That I now saw aright, I could not and would not doubt for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses, and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a vignette manner much in the style of the favourite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague, yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly gilded and filigreed in moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself but it could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the countenance which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all, could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting, and of the frame must have instantly dispelled such idea. 
must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained, for an hour perhaps, half sitting, half reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute lifelikeliness of expression, which, at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position. The cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view, I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art, she a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all light and smiles, and frolicsome as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments, which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark, high turret chamber, where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour, and from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man, who became lost in reveries, so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on, uncomplainingly, because she saw that the painter, who had high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth, some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words, as of a mighty marvel, and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labour drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret, for the painter had grown wild with the ardour of his work, had turned his eyes from the canvas merely, even to regard the countenance of his wife and he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sat beside him. And when many weeks bad passed, and but little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye, the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed, and, for one moment, the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought. But in the next, while he yet gazed, 
he grew tremulous and very pallid, and aghast, and crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself, turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>